Hi, I'm Kelly Chase and this is History Detective and today I want to talk about First Nations contributions to World War II and in particular the Northern Territory Special Reconnaissance Unit. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this video is being recorded today. I pay my respects to the elders and knowledge holders past, present and emerging. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are warned that the following video may contain images of deceased persons. During World War II, First Nations Australians were generally not accepted into the armed forces. This was even baked into the fitness section of the military regulations. No person is to be enlisted voluntarily unless he is substantially of European origin or descent. This meant that only Aboriginal men who could prove enough European ancestry were able to join. However, this all changed after Japan entered the war and the government began to fear the security of the Northern Territory. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander soldiers in the north of Australia were recruited. More than 800 signed up to join the uniformed Torres Strait Light Infantry. This was a segregated battalion. But there was another group made up of 50 non-uniformed men with incredible tracking skills who became known as the Northern Territory Special Reconnaissance Unit. Before World War II, often First Nations Australians were treated appallingly by white Australians and government institutions. They were dispossessed of their lands and the victims of systematic killings. Additionally, the government relocated many Aboriginal people to missions and reserves. In these reserves, the government created laws that stripped First Nations people of their basic human rights. They lost the right to freedom of movement and freedom of labour. The government would keep their wages safe, meaning that that money would never be seen again. Some states forbade marriage without permission, and they lost control over their own property among other restrictions. Additionally, First Nations people were not counted as Australian citizens and were not entitled to vote. They were basically stripped of their land, money, freedom and had no political voice in the very government that controlled their lives. In fact, many elderly Aboriginal veterans of the First World War were unable to get on the old age pension simply because they were Aboriginal. Aboriginal rights activist groups had begun to emerge and were fighting for their right to both enlist and vote. Some Aboriginal men did manage to enlist earlier on, only to find themselves discharged a few months later. As the threat of Japanese invasion loomed, the army needed manpower and changed their tune and created the segregated Torres Strait Light Infantry and the Northern Territory Special Reconnaissance Unit. The Northern Territory Special Reconnaissance Unit was under the command of Donald F. Thompson. He was an anthropologist, which is someone who studies people, society and culture. In 1928, he was given a grant of £600 to go to Cape York to study the First Nations people. He was also commissioned to make friends with the tribes of Arnhem Land. Because North Queensland and the Northern Territory were not as populated by colonists, many indigenous tribes still existed and Thompson spent two and a half years learning their language, adopting their lifestyle and establishing relationships with many of the leaders. Cut to 1941. Thompson was a flight lieutenant in the Air Force and he gave a lecture at the Victoria Barracks in Melbourne about the Arnhem Land tribes. In the audience were the Army Chief of Staff and the Director of Military Operations. They were struck with the idea of harnessing the skills of the Arnhem Land tribes to form a covert reconnaissance unit that could protect and patrol the northern coast and would be headed up by Thompson, who already had well-established relationships with many of the tribes and could speak their languages. And so he moved from the Air Force to the Army to head up the Northern Territory Special Reconnaissance Unit. One of the benefits of the Army using Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders for this job was the only wage they would have to pay was Thompson's and a couple of other white officers. The First Nations people were not paid in money but in tobacco, fish hooks, wire for fish spears, knives, tomahawks and pipes. They were also issued with two pieces of calico, a blanket and a brass disc carved with a number to wear around their neck. Thompson wrote about their work ethic. 
freely and without complaint, they submitted to the rigorous discipline and without pay, without any guarantee of reward, with only the most primitive equipment and without arms or weapons, they gave their best in loyalty, unrelenting hard work and sweat in the stronghold of the people from whom they had known neither justice nor understanding. Some worked seven days a week for 10 months and others served continuously for 18 months without a break and no financial recompense. It was not until 1992, 50 years after the unit operated, that the Australian government finally awarded back pay and medals to the surviving veterans and their families. In 1942, the unit began its intensive training. They did military drills, surprise attacks, night approaches, infiltration, regrouping, marching and patrols. One exercise involved a long night swim through a mosquito-infested mangrove-filled river. To ensure that the unit was truly covert and not recognisable as being affiliated with the Australian Army, Thompson insisted that they not use guns, but only traditional weapons. However, he did make an exception and trained them in the use of Molotov cocktails, which are a kind of a petrol bomb in a glass bottle with a rag out the top that you light before you throw. The unit went barefoot so their boot prints could not be tracked and did not wear uniforms. Additionally, the unit did not need a supply line as they were adept at living off the land. And this was yet another economic bonus for the army, not having to continually supply these soldiers with food. Donald Thompson was later awarded an OBE, which is basically a medal from the Queen for outstanding civil service. But unfortunately, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members of the unit received very little recognition of their work, despite Thompson's glowing recommendations in his report. In 1949, when Thompson was attending an Anzac Day march in Darwin, the Department of Native Affairs did not allow his right-hand man, Rayawala, to attend the ceremony. Don't forget to hit subscribe, and if you would like to hear an original song on this topic, you'll find a link to Who Decides the Heroes up there. And in the show notes, you'll find a link to the History Detective website, where you'll find a list of references and links to teaching resources. This is Kelly Chase on The Case.